Welcome everyone uh, to the second of our uh, webinars this academic year. Um, we are uh, very pleased in the CITP to be able to run these series, hopefully to bring some of the issues that we spend our lives on, uh, as it were, you know, to a, to a broader audience. I'm Alan Winters, I'm the co-director of the CITP and also actually working on um, uh, carbon policy and trade policy together. I've got uh, two um, very eminent uh, speakers on uh, carbon border adjustments uh, today. Uh, the first is uh, Professor Emily Lidgate from University of Sussex. She's an environmental lawyer, um, but also theme leader in the Centre for Inclusive Trade Policy, um, in the theme that is covering, uh, among other things, uh, climate policy. And she's also Deputy Director of the UK Trade Policy Observatory. Uh, the second speaker is uh, Tim Figures, who is an Associate Director at uh, Boston Consulting Group. He's previously worked in um, one of the precursors to the Department of Business and Trade um, on uh, sort of you know, exciting trade policy over the last uh, several years. And now I guess he can say he's focusing on yeah, how do these policies impinge on business? Uh, so uh, as it were, an exact complement to what we have got in uh, academia. So Emily will explain carbon border adjustments, but basically they involve trying to charge for greenhouse gas emissions on imports of certain products to the same extent that domestic producers have to, um, have to pay them. Uh, last Sunday, 1st of October, was a big day in this because after I guess, something like 30 years chatter about it, something actually happened on the ground. The EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, sort of kicked into play, kicking in very gently at the moment, uh, but it's there and it is now operational. Um, so this is just the right moment to have uh, two experts explain it all to us. So let me hand over straight away to uh, Emily, um, who will start the conversation off. Emily. Thanks very much, Alan. And I have the sense that some of you who are on this call are probably sick of CBAM already. So I thank those of you uh, for coming along anyway. And some of you probably only have a big uh, notion of what it is. So um, I thought I would follow my sort of high school journalism uh, advice for clarity and do a quick sort of who, what, when, where, why of CBAM. Um, and then I think we'll spend the rest of the time on this uh, contentious issue of how. <laughs> so um, Alan has already helped us with the what and the um, the when. Um, and I'm really glad that Tim is on the call to help uh, help us understand how how industry is is greeting this phase one of of CBAM, which has just started this week. Um, as well as the EU, the UK is also um, contemplating CBAM, um, but we don't know yet whether they will uh, follow the EU, uh, the Committee on Climate Change, whose job it is to tell the UK government uh, what to do when it comes to net zero. Um, policy has said that the UK should uh, do CBAM. Um, and there's been a government consultation. But the, the research I'm going to talk about shortly is, is coming into this space of uncertainty. Um, so um, the EU uh, has chosen uh, six sectors, um, which are priced under its emissions trading scheme, um, and which are high emitting and which are heavily traded. So these include, include steel, aluminium, fertilizers and a few others. Um, and these are um, sectors in which it's going to extend these ETS prices to imported products. Um, why does the EU uh, want to do this? Well, the argument they, they that they have presented is that if they don't, then they're incentivizing dirtier, higher emitting goods, high carbon goods um, to be produced in other countries. Um, they're cheaper because they're not priced, and this will slow the low carbon transition. So this is the concept of carbon leakage. Um, and, and so hopefully that's all relatively straightforward, but that brings us to how you do this. Um, and, and I think there's really two main reasons why the how of CBAM has proven so difficult. Um, um, and one of them is that it's just 
technically complex to ask foreign firms to internalize these uh, pricing requirements um, and also to verify that they have done so. Um, and the other one is that it goes right to the heart of what is probably the most uh, contentious issue in global climate cooperation, which is um, what, what is fair. So I've already given you the EU side of the story um, about why they need to do this for their producers and for decar their de decarbonization agenda. But the other side of that story is that the approach of the Paris Agreement is to allow countries to determine their own uh, national approaches to decarbonizing, um, in particular developing countries uh, who have contributed less to the problem historically and, and in many cases still now. So why should they be forced to bear a sort of a punitive trade measure that exports the EU's domestic approach to them? So, um, so what I'm going to do is, is give you a little a taster, I'll, I'll call it a taster, of um, some of our recent research on a couple of the more kind of stubborn corners of CBAM that I think speak to these more conceptual challenges pretty directly. Um, the first is the case of Northern Ireland, uh, and the second is the case of least uh, developed countries. Um, and I, I guess I, I, I would also say that the kind of the, the headline finding of these, which I think is really the headline of the many, many pages that at this stage we've all written at CITP and UKTPO about CBAM, is that it is a policy that is inherently suboptimal. It's a kind of a blunt tool which creates some collateral damage. Uh, so from a sort of a policymaking perspective, the, the task or the challenge is to, is to minimize that challenge as, or that damage as much as possible. Um, and the reason to do it is really that it's better than the alternative of not doing it. So it's not an inspirational message <laughs> particularly, but it seems to be uh, where, where we keep ending up. So um, on Northern Ireland, we have um, a, a CITP working paper um, from Xinyan Zhao and Dong Zhizhang, which came out last month, and also a forthcoming briefing paper, which you can find on the CITP website, which looks at the issues in Northern Ireland in depth. Um, but essentially, the basic problem with EU CBAM in Northern Ireland is that there's no customs border between Northern Ireland and the rest of Ireland. In other words, between Northern Ireland and the EU. So that means that if a firm wanted to circumvent EU CBAM requirements and they can get their goods into Northern Ireland, they can travel onto the EU. So not surprisingly, the EU is concerned about this and wants EU CBAM requirements to apply in Northern Ireland. But what does that mean um, in practice? Um, the approach of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is now the Windsor Framework, is that Northern Ireland must follow EU regulations. So that's kind of the, the price of the unmanned border with the rest of Ireland and with the EU single market. But it only has to follow regulations that are set out in an annex. Uh, and this doesn't include CBAM because it's a new regulation. So for CBAM to be included in the annex, the EU has to propose it to the Joint Committee of the EU and UK, and the UK has to agree. If the UK doesn't agree, the EU can retaliate. Um, so you can already see that CBAM is positioned to become a sort of a, a test of the newfound settlement and the newfound cooperative spirit between the UK and the EU in Northern Ireland. Um, but if you continue looking at this problem, the plot continues to thicken because uh, Northern Ireland is not part of the EU emissions trading scheme. It's part of the EU emissions trading scheme. And under the approach that the European Commission has already defined, that means that Northern Ireland firms can't be absolved of CBAM, except for electricity, which is part of the EU emissions trading scheme. So, um, you know, if, if, Nor if we're then asking Northern Ireland firms to be subject to EU CBAM charges, EU CBAM requirements, then essentially we're asking, um, you know, the Northern Ireland authorities to apply these EU CBAM requirements sort of on behalf of the EU. The UK can block this, but it would lead to, um, you know, trade retaliation most likely. Um, and there's also an immediate economic question, which is how um, will EU CBAM harm Northern Ireland competitiveness because Northern Ireland firms are very integrated with the rest of Ireland. So um, in, in the briefing paper, Dongjia has run the, the numbers on this. 
um, and they're all set out in the working paper. But um, we're phrasing the impacts of this as not insignificant. <laughs> in other words, um, around 10% of Northern Ireland exports of the pro of products that are fall under CBAM go on to the rest of Ireland. And that um, equates to around a quarter of the jobs in these industries in Northern Ireland are linked to EU exports. So um, if your head is now hurting, <laughs> I hope you can empathize with us and our process of trying to set all this out. Um, but I think perhaps unusually, there is a pretty clear solution, at least to state, um, which would address all of these problems simultaneously which is that the UK could link its emissions trading scheme to the EU, as uh, Switzerland and, and the EEA countries have done. Um, and it could have its own CBAM in the same sectors that sort of mirrors the EU. So if you did this kind of linking and mirroring, then you would, first of all, alleviate all the CBAM charges and requirements on Northern Irish firms, which would be handy. Um, but also, um, you know, prevent circumvention of the CBAM, which is what the EU is concerned about. Keeping in mind the EU and the UK ETS were the same, um, you know, until Brexit. Um, so this is one of those issues where um, if there weren't this kind of allergy to cooperating with the EU in certain respects, which has characterized uh, the UK government's strategy in many areas, um, there, there would be a very clear and tangible benefit to trade um, of, of alignment. And it seems to be relatively feasible as compared to some other elements of, of, of dynamic alignment. So, um, so that's, that's a clear policy recommendation. Um, and, and for a long time, the EU and UK uh, pri carbon prices were tracking pretty closely, but now they've really diverged. So the UK's last I checked is less than half of the EU carbon price. So uh, 35 pounds a ton versus 78. And then that, and that will, that's going to make this a lot more challenging. So, uh, that brings us to the second, uh, bit of research that we've done recently that I wanted to highlight. Um, and this is led by Sunayana Sasmal and Dong Zhizhang in a briefing paper that will be out imminently, hopefully even this week. Um, and in this briefing paper, we argue that if the UK were to implement its own CBAM, um, it should also have some mechanism for lessening or eliminating the costs and regulatory requirements for least developed countries. Um, why should it do this? Well, it's fairer. It brings the CBAM more into line with the Paris Agreement's approach and, and principles. Um, it's not something that the EU has chosen to do, but we also advocate that the EU should, should do this as well. Um, and the numbers support that doing this would not undermine the sort of climate-based objectives of the CBAM because um, the UK and EU import very little from least developed countries. So um, in total, imports from least developed countries take up 0.03% of the overall imports of these CBAM covered goods in, in, the, in the UK and 0.38% in the EU. But in some individual sectors and in, in, in least developed countries, CBAM could have a big negative impact. So the most notable, notable example is uh, Mozambique and, and aluminium. So we set out to, to think about how uh, the UK might, might uh, go about uh, this exemption. Um, if the e UK or the EU for that matter just gave a blanket exemption from all charges and administrative requirements to least developed countries, um, what might happen is that other developing countries could complain. So for example, low and middle income countries who do export quite a lot of these CBAM goods to the UK and EU could go to the WTO and they should say, well, we're developing countries as well. Why do we have to pay full price? So you need a legal basis for an exemption. Um, and I, if I were to, to, to summarize, you know, I'm not gonna go into all the details of the legal pathways that we analyzed, but there's certainly some legal risk involved. So the basic problem is that even though the WTO does allow some more favorable treatment for developing countries, this has really largely been limited to tariff treatment, different tariffs rather than different taxes. Um, so the UK could say, okay, well, we're gonna try to align with this general approach. We're gonna just classify CBAM as a tariff. 
Um, but that is a workaround that entails its own uh, difficulties and challenges, which I, which I won't get into. And even if you have just have long phase-in periods for CBAM, you can still be challenged. So um, the UK could, could, could try something else. Instead, it could have exemption criteria that are origin neutral. So they're not so clearly discriminatory, but they target least developed countries. So for example, exemptions for low export thresholds or based on low contribution to greenhouse gas emissions from, from uh, least developed countries, but in some objective threshold. Um, you know, it's impossible to say unequivocally that these approaches are WTO compliant. Uh, their defense is based on a particular interpretation of WTO rules, which is uncertain, or, you know, in some cases has been ruled out in the 1980s. <laughs> but so essentially what we've done is to kind of magnify some of these legal complexities. Um, and also really to point out that if you're in a situation where there's no WTO appellate body, no WTO high court, there's no system of binding precedent, um, you know, it makes sense to try to do this while honoring the, the letter of the law as much as possible, but also not losing losing sight of, of the spirit of the law um, and, and of the Paris Agreement. So, um, you know, I hope this has helped uh, illustrate why CBAM um, feels like like a regulatory version of one of those mad M.C. Escher paintings where, you know, the deeper you get into it, the more you get confused <laughs> about which way is up. Um, but I think, you know, we do, we do, there do seem to be some pathways through which are more optimal than others. And so I hope we can continue to, to throw our, our weight behind those and having utterly exhausted my, my audience, I think I'll, I'll pass over to you, Tim. <laughs> or thank, actually, you very, yeah, thank you very much, Emily. <laughs> uh, great to be with you. Now, imagine you take that complication, which Emily has just been discussing in sort of legal or policy terms, and then put yourself in the mindset of a Chinese steel producer or an Indian fertilizer manufacturer or someone like that, making a CBAM covered product and exporting it to the EU, working out what on earth they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to respond. Uh, well, I suppose the good news is that there are people like me and BCG around who will work and are working with those types of um, companies to answer those questions. But I think it is an important general point that in the end, this is a policy instrument that will impact global supply chains. It's intended to and will have both direct and indirect consequences for a range of uh, economic actors, businesses in particular, some of whom are not in the EU, have no familiarity with the European way of doing things, don't know what carbon pricing is, have never heard of the EU ETS, and for whom this will be quite a, quite a significant challenge. So, um, but just before I go in detail in some of, into some of the analysis we've done about specifically what, what the issues and impacts might be, uh, Emily's absolutely right. This is a complex and suboptimal situation, but geopolitically, it is an inevitable consequence of a more multipolar world. The simplest way to deal with the problem of carbon leakage would be, as the OECD has been proposing for years, a global carbon price, where everyone in the world paid the same carbon price for, for emission, industrial emissions, then we wouldn't have a problem. That is uh, absolutely right from a regulatory and economics point of view. From a political point of view, it's never going to happen. So unless uh, you know, developed economies sit on their hands and don't take action um, until the rest of the world catches up, which is probably going to be never, you're going to start to see these distinctions between the pace of climate action that the EU or the UK or the United States or other G7, G7 economies in particular, uh, develop, and then other parts of the world following at a much slower pace. China not even got a net zero commitment uh, until 2060, India 2070, so 20 years behind the, the, the commitments that uh, most developed economies have made. Um, and because the kind of products that are impacted like steel or fertilizers or aluminium, you know, they're not locally made, they're globally traded products. Inevitably, this question of carbon leakage has to be dealt with. And you get this really interesting uh, fusion between the global trading system and climate action, of which CBAM is the most significant, but we're starting to see 
other countries doing uh, equivalent things, such as, for example, some of the conditions that the United States puts on the subsidies available for decarbonisation um, under the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. But given where we are and all of the complications and tensions that Emily has has mentioned, well, what is the what will the consequences be for businesses? And I'll just talk a little bit as well um, for for governments. Well, firstly, there are two levels of consequence. The immediate consequence is a legal or compliance one. There are new systems and processes that you're obliged to engage with. Uh, in order to continue to trade with the EU. But the medium term implications are much more strategic. What does it mean in terms of the relative competitiveness of a particular product or a particular company or a particular country if carbon costs that previously were disregarded are now factored into the equation? And how does that change incentives to purchase their products as opposed to equivalent ones made by other people? Now, um, the short term compliance challenge, I don't want to, you know, understate for the kinds of businesses that I was talking about, it will be significant. And look, we've talked about, well, what does CBAM, CBAM came into force on Sunday? It did well. But specifically, what started on Sunday was you if you are selling CBAM products to the EU, if with effect from Sunday, you have to count the emissions that go into them. Because by January next year, you'll have to submit a report setting out your scope one and scope two emissions embedded in your product going back to the 1st of October. And if you haven't started counting as of two days ago, you're going to have a problem filling out that report. And then as we go through the transitional period, um, there'll be further regulatory obligations about how you calculate other things you have to report, registration and so forth. And then on the 1st of January 2026, you actually have to start paying, although the amount you pay will phase in over, over an eight year period. And the big costs are end loaded. So the big costs come from about 2030 which is within the investment time horizon of the kinds of big capital intensive businesses like steel companies uh, that I work with. So if you are a third country producer making steel, uh, for example, you've got to start counting your emissions and, and, and declare those. If you are an importer into the EU, you will have to set up systems and processes uh, to deal with this because you're the one that's legally obliged to report these uh, emissions to the European Commission and you're the one that gets fined uh, if you don't. Um, and if you are an end user, if you're someone in the European Union buying these products, you're going to be impacted. Now, you won't have any direct legal obligations, but the price of products that you buy will go up over time. Uh, if they are high carbon versions of steel or aluminium or whatever. And if you think about the range of sectors from construction to um, white goods manufacturer to automotive to packaging that CBAM products end up being used in, you can see a very significant uh, chunk of European industry will be uh, impacted by that. And that kind of brings me on to those medium term impacts. Once you've got to pay for carbon imports, what does that actually incentivize you as a producer and a consumer to do? Well, as a producer, hopefully what it should do, and this is certainly the European Union's intention, it should incentivize you to uh, decarbonize. So just like domestic European manufacturers are now decarbonizing because of carbon pricing, carbon pricing on exports should make um, investments in you know, efficient improvements or technology change viable uh, in a way they aren't if you can emit carbon for free. There's a couple of problems with that approach, though, which we have to watch. One is those uh, manufacturers are only selling a proportion of their product to the EU. And whereas an EU producer pays carbon costs on all its production, let a third country producer will only pay carbon costs on the um, proportion of its production it sells to the EU, which might be a minority. Secondly, there is always the option for those producers, given the multipolar world I was uh, talking about, to simply say, well, we're not going to sell our product in the EU anymore. We'll sell it in other uh, emerging markets where there aren't CBAMs and no one prices carbon. 
that's always a possibility and it'll be interesting to see how 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 actual trade flows uh, shift over time the final group um and they're touching on what emily was saying of of stakeholders that need to think about the impact uh in my view um are governments um because uh whether it is uh, governments of emerging markets or, or less developed countries like Mozambique, or even governments like the UK, um, because this is something that has an impact on global trade, it will have an impact on what I often call the carbon competitiveness of governments. So if you are exporting a lot of products to the EU, particularly carbon intensive products, which the UK does, by the way, when you look at things like steel, um, uh, Mozambique or Turkey or Brazil or India or China, CBAM reduces your carbon competitiveness. You might find, particularly if you are an emerging market, quite a lot of global multinationals might have chosen to locate production there precisely because there were lower environmental standards or no carbon prices and are then exporting that cheaper product back to developed markets. CBAM removes the economic logic for that kind of offshoring and so maybe uh, might prompt a different approach from those multinationals with a knock-on effect for the carbon competitiveness of those particular countries. And a number of those, if you look, let's say, at the GCC countries or some or, or some like Indonesia that have got very carbon intensive export baskets are thinking about how they might diversify their their um, their production and exports more generally to mitigate this kind of risk. So um, just going on now to um, complications. Well, uh, I think this is only the start of what's going to be a long and very interesting journey. Uh, this is the first time anyone, uh, as Alan was saying, has actually tried to do a CBAM in practice, and it's been a, it's been a, a you know, a theoretical concept in the economics classroom for quite a long time, but now it's actually being implemented into the global trading system, and in recognition of that fact, the EU is starting small and with a relatively open mind, and is going to evolve the system over time. But one thing that is often overlooked is that before 2026, so before CBAM becomes fully implemented, the European Commission is required to do a very detailed report looking at how the scheme might be extended both to other products currently covered by the EU ETS, to scope two and maybe scope three emissions, to complex products, to services, um, and a range of other uh, uh, other areas, which could see, depending on how that uh, that works out, by 2030, uh, the CBAM covering quite a significantly wider range of products than um, than just the relatively small list it begins with. Secondly, I touched about touched on governments, but let's see how other governments react. Some might, some almost certainly will challenge. Uh, CBAM at the World Trade Organization, whether uh, that gets anywhere for the reasons Emily described, we'll have to see. But other governments might take a different approach. So, for example, um, Turkey is looking and maybe even India at introducing its own domestic carbon pricing regime, uh, which would reduce the uh, exposure of its exports to the CBAM. Um, Canada has floated the idea of some kind of carbon or climate club, and the United States is looking at something similar with its transatlantic dialogue on steel and aluminium, where a group of countries with broadly similar net zero policies might club together. And you could see those clubs um, developing um, a new range of free trade agreements that deal not with free trade in goods, but free trade in carbon. And that would reduce the complexity of the CBAM considerably if many of the world's advanced uh, trading economies were within a kind of carbon free trade um, block. Um, and, you know, will some of those other countries follow follow suit? I think by the end of the decade, we'll see CBAMs in maybe five or six other other countries, including the UK, Canada, 
um, Australia, Korea, um, maybe Japan, maybe China, possibly the United States. And you can start to see the, if that's true, the emergence of quite a powerful block. If you've got the US, China and the EU, the world's three largest economies are all within a similar system, then you are really going to start to um, turn, the, turn the dial on trade. Um, finally, and then I'm really looking forward to the discussion. I see some questions are starting to come in. Where does this leave the UK? There is the specific issue of um, Northern Ireland that Emily was mentioning. But I think what's going to be even, you know, even more interesting building on that is what options a future Labour government, assuming that's what we get next year, what options did they actually have for making good on their commitment to improve relationships uh, with the EU. There's an awful lot that they can't do because of their um, decision to rule out single market or customs union membership. There are some other things they've said they would like to do, but it's not entirely clear to me why it would be in the EU's interests to agree to such a thing. You need to have two sides, both of whom feel they can get something out of a, a trade related deal for it to it to actually work. But on energy and climate, there is actually, I think, um, scope for um, for agreement. First of all, um, as a consequence of you know some foresighted actions by some of my former colleagues, um, the UK EU trade and cooperation agreement actually has some interesting provisions in it on energy and climate, much more developed than you might than you see on goods and certainly on services, um, including a broad commitment to carbon pricing and things like that, and the option to link the UK and EU uh, ETSs. Um, there would be benefits to both the UK and the EU for reconnecting wholesale electricity and gas markets because uh, the UK benefits from an energy security perspective, but the EU benefits from having a place to sell excess capacity uh, when it can't consume it uh, itself. And those arrangements were, were badly disrupted by Brexit. And there are some other very practical areas of cooperation, particularly with the EU member states closest to us, such as the North Sea um, offshore wind farms and the interconnected grids that are the most efficient way of getting that power from the middle of the North Sea to Belgium, Netherlands um, uh, and the UK. And also things like carbon capture use and storage, where we have got plenty of places where you could sequester carbon, but the EU doesn't have enough locations to meet its new targets under its Net Zero Industry Act. So for all of those reasons, if the, if, if there is a future Labour government and they were they were interested, I think this is an area where you could see scope for some closer cooperation, which presumably would involve as the kind of UK, one of the things the UK would get uh, a Swiss style exemption from the sea ban for UK exports to the EU27. So I think I'll stop there. I, I hope that was a useful perspective, looking at it more from the business side of the fence. And I'll hand back to you, Alan, for questions and discussion. Well, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, thank you, um, Emily. Uh, it's nice to end up on a note that's even half optimistic. Um, <laughs> perhaps I can, uh, I, I've got a couple of questions come in, but let me perhaps pose one, uh, first of all, directly to Tim. Have you got any idea, uh, any estimate of how much the administration uh, would be for a firm that had to turn in, um, uh, you know, its um, uh, information on its embedded emissions, uh, presuming that it started from nowhere? You know, so a firm in India which hasn't had to think about this stuff so far, are we talking about, you know, so, you know take a typical uh, you know, product, if you wish, but, you know, are we talking about you know, a third of a percent, one percent, three percent, that sort of thing? Um, I think it depends a bit. It depends a bit on um, how easy it is to comply with the EU's, EU's um, methodologies. I mean, not that. I mean, the actual administrative costs, not that much. A few, you know, 10, maybe tens of thousands of euros to get it set up. And then um, uh, mainly which would might be, you know, things like, 
uh, hi hiring a verifier to help um, develop the monitoring and verification plan um, and doing some initial calculations about 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 product carbon footprint so probably not um, massive in terms of cost I think the challenge is more uh, understanding of what's the right thing to do with such a highly highly complex issue and one of the things that a lot of companies said to the European Commission as CBAM was going through was that you really do need to provide much more detailed guidance and advice suitable for people kind of around the world don't do the usual thing of just putting your regulation on the web on the website and hoping people can understand it and actually to be fair to dg tax they have done that and there is now a lot of really very interesting guidance including specific sections for each of the impacted products which um businesses around the world are now are now looking at and trying to absorb okay thanks very much uh, so let's move on to the questions that I'm receiving, um, but let me urge everybody else uh, to put in questions into the Q&A box uh, if you have them. Uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question, just ask. Uh, so look, the first question I had uh, from uh, Alistair, um, Emily, for you, I think, is just to say, look, if we exempted least developed countries uh, from the CBAN, aren't we running the risk that other countries would just uh, direct their trade through the LDCs and, and give them free up the advantage of, uh, of exemption? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I don't have any, any proof for this, but I imagine that that's one of the reasons that the commission didn't want to exempt LDCs even under, you know, considerable pressure and a lot of diplomatic backlash in their seeming um, insensitivity <laughs> to the developing country issue from many quarters um, that, you know, as well as the legal complexities, there's, there's uh, the circumvention risk, um, you know, so that, so that would be another thing if there were an exemption that would require, um, you know, a set of procedures to avoid circumvention. And I think one other way of looking at this is because I mean, there clearly is a problem with certain LDCs like Mozambique um, um, is to say, well, um, on the other side of the coin, most of the OECD economies give quite large amounts of, of visual development assistance to LDCs. Um, some of which tends to go on things like what we commonly call aid and trade, aid and trade. So help for economic development, climate change, adaptation, resilience, and promoting exports. So one way um, developed economies could address the problem, rather than having an exemption, is to say, well, we will make sure that our aid and trade money turns into aid for green trade, and actually help support um, Mozambique or whoever it is make the investment to decarbonize their exports, then they don't have a CBAM problem and you have made an appreciable contribution to uh, climate change. Yeah. Uh, Mozambique's problem with aluminium exports to the EU is massive. I think 65% of their exports to the EU are of uh, um, aluminium and I think it's 23% of their total exports to the whole world are aluminium. Uh, to the EU. So, uh, you know, the case for technical assistance and financial assistance would seem to be pretty large, just from a pragmatic point of view. Okay, so I've got another question here from Alessandro, but the rest of you, please don't be shy. Um, uh, Alessandro essentially says, I think this is directed to you, Tim, you know, that we don't have too much discussion of the certification of emissions that the or verification is the term that the uh, EU uses. So we sort of talk about the burden that firms will face to uh, collect the information, but it has to be verified, presumably by an EU approved verifier. Uh, I don't know if you can say something about you know the complexity of just organizing that and what a growth industry it will be. Whoever's in that the game? Yeah, it's certainly the business to be in third country, um, you know, emissions verification. So a couple of things. Firstly, um, the EU has set out in quite a lot of detail how you should calculate emissions. It is for 
Le WTO legal reasons, presumably, very, very similar to how you would do it under the EU ETS uh, in order to come up with you know, what they can argue is an equivalent uh, carbon cost. Um, but it is complex uh, and uh, it is a bespoke methodology that you know, isn't necessarily the same as people might use for other regulatory or voluntary purposes. Um, and it does include this concept of independent verification. Now, um, there are entrepreneurial consultancies, not us offering that service. Initially, we thought verification was going to be needed now, you know, this, this year. But uh, the European Commission have said, actually, you've got until January 2026 to get your emissions verified. So there is a bit of time both for more capacity to come into the verification system, but also for third country producers to find a verifier and, and, and work through the process. But I think what you've touched on there, Alessandro, is, you know, is, is a broader issue, which is uh, particularly if we get into climate clubs, we're going to need to find some kind of common way of reporting emissions and calculating and embedded emissions at the product level. And we don't really have that at the moment. The European Union has its way, which, uh, you know, in line with its general regulatory posture, it's saying to everyone else, well, as long as you do it my way, our way, then that's fine. That probably isn't going to wash it when you're dealing, wash when you're dealing with um, countries like the United States um, or China. So uh, one of the challenges, I think, as uh, this network of CBAMs expands is can... Um, the EU find a mechanism, uh, a more of an equivalence mechanism for accepting other people's carbon um, calculation methodologies, even though they're not exactly the same as, as the EU's own. That is not how the EU generally does things, uh, particularly when it comes to trade style agreements. So it'd be interesting to see if they're willing to adopt a more flexible approach in future. Now, I think I'm correct in saying there is a WTO group on measuring emissions and I think em embedded emissions. Do we know if that's made any contribution to the conversation yet, either, I mean, either of you? I, I mean, I think it, I, it certainly was something that was very much under discussion um, at uh, the WTO public forum a few weeks ago, wasn't it? Uh, I know I know the WTO has identified that is an area where it could add value. Uh, interestingly, on the in the in the other part of the uh, UN ecosystem, the UNFCCC has also seen that this uh, linkage is happening. And um, this year's COP, the for the first time, will have a trade and climate day. Okay. So right. the, yeah. So the WTO yeah. is getting into carbon measurement, and the UNFCCC <laughs> is getting into trade. So uh, we'll see whether those two initiatives uh, join up together. Excellent. Okay. Um, so a, a question from uh, Ross Turner. Um, Emily, perhaps you can uh, deal with this to start with. You know, how severe is the risk of countermeasures from FDA partners? And I suppose sort of behind that is, look, is, is the legal structure of FTAs different in a way that means even if it's WTO compliant, the FDA partners can object you know, or, or perhaps vice versa? So, I mean, the uh, generally FTAs provide scope for their partners to introduce new environmental domestic. It's it's a unilateral domestic environmental measure, CBAM, even though it applies to to goods coming in, um, and it applies to countries more or less uh, across the board. Um, although the way that those obligations bite them differs based on how many uh, emissions they have domestically. Um, and that will probably be a point of contention, uh, both in the WTO and potentially, um, you know, also through through FTAs. Um, I just think in terms of kind of a strategic approach, um, it would make more sense for countries to challenge this in the WTO versus an FTA. Um, because if they challenge it in, in the WTO, then uh, whatever um, outcome of that dispute is, although, you know, in this day and age, it could be appealed into the void and, and, and not be binding. But, um, but, but, the, but the idea of sending a global message 
about um, about the legality of a of a unilateral measure seems to be more impactful than uh, than using FTA adjudication. Um, having said that, I mean it's 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 possible that um, you know that that there could be um, FTAs I, I, certainly on the on the diplomatic level. You know they have they have all these committees that are set up to discuss environmental issues and and the, and there could be scope for 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 CBAM to be to be part of that discussion. But there's nothing in FTAs that 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 sort of prevents um, the the EU or or the UK or any other country from introducing CBAM. Oh, well, and it's also interesting to see, I was seeing some reporting this week that it's becoming an issue in live negotiations. So Brazil's reportedly saying its price for agreement to the EU Mercosur deal is exemption from the CBAM for its exports, <laughs> which it's not going to get. But you can see, you know, there's a really good example of how uh, uh, it, it's it's becoming a, uh, an, offensive, uh, an offensive ask. I mean, in the other, the opposite of a defensive, not a not a rude uh, ask by um, key partners at a critical stage in a trade neg- uh, in a trade agreement negotiation, where everybody wants to get this done and does it. So it will add another twenty years to EU Mercosur. Um, okay, I have a question from Anonymous. Um, I guess this. Uh, uh, let me direct this towards uh, you, Tim, at least to start with. Has there been a significant industry backlash to CBAM about threats to move business outside the EU? And is this a serious threat to the viability of CBAM? I mean, I think in a sense, the question is, you know, is business just swallowing and accommodating or does business still think it's got a chance to, you know, subvert, I suppose is the word, uh, CBAM? Um... No, I'm so I, I I don't think CBAM is going to lead to business leaving the EU. I think actually probably the opposite. I think because of the, uh, as I was saying earlier, because of offshoring decisions that were clearly made in part to avoid environmental costs. Uh, once uh, CBAM means you can't avoid those environmental costs anymore, does the rest of the I- equation of offshoring, which has negatives like distance and equality issues, that still stack up? So we might actually see some onshoring or some nearshoring happen as, as, as a result of CBAM. If you look specifically at EU producers, though, the key thing they need to, the key issue they're facing, which is as a direct consequence of CBAM, but isn't technically part of CBAM, is the phasing out of the very generous free allowances they currently get under the EU emissions trading system. So if you're a steel maker in the EU, you're probably getting around two thirds of your carbon costs basically free at the moment. You're only paying around a third of your carbon costs and two thirds you're receiving free uh, permits from the regulators. Um, As carbon leakage protection uh, switches to CBAM, those free allowances will be withdrawn and uh, by 20 34, they will all have been gone. They will all all have gone. That will represent very significant additional carbon costs for EU producers, which unless they move to decarbonise, will have significant uh, consequences. And it's no uh, accident, given that regulatory landscape, we're starting to see some very big announcements made by steel, which is by far and away the worst impacted sector. Um, Actually, steel companies and governments actually putting very large sums of money now uh, down on the table to um, start to decarbonise European steel production. So, I mean, is it true, in a sense, that we can characterise this as business accepts that it actually has got to be part of the problem, it accepts that it's got to be part of the solution. And so it is sort of moving into a sort of more pragmatic how to rather than obstructionist whether to. Yeah, d- definitely. There, the, the uncertainty about the future regulatory trajectory, particularly when other ETS sectors will come into CBAM, means that there are some sectors where it probably makes sense just to kind of sit tight for the moment and see where it goes. But if you are in phase one, if you are in CBAM phase one, uh, there's no doubt that if you look at CBAM and ETS uh, free allowance reduction and carbon price increases, 
the economics of decarbonisation have shifted and the, the the policy that this suite of market based measures is that you cause them is having the desired effect on business cases for decarbonisation and the kind of clients I work with look at this look at this sort of thing extremely carefully. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um so uh further question uh now from uh, Suniana. Um do you think that technology transfers can be mobilized to help country uh, firms in developing countries comply with emissions uh requirements? I mean, or perhaps even more generally, just you know, to cope with emissions uh mitigation. Um, but you know, the CBAM in a sense gives you a real focus. Um, that you might um, uh, attach that to. Uh, Emily, should I start with you, but uh, then I'll come to you, Tim. Yeah, sure. And I think that the broader point here is that, um, you know, if if the 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 uh, the goal of the CBAM, which is purportedly, you know, the goal as an environmental measure, is to help global decarbonization and to prevent it from being undermined, then the best way to do that is actually to take a, a, a global perspective and, and, and the sort of carrot rather than stick based perspective about uh, of thinking through how uh, the low carbon transition can be helped in uh, poorer countries. Um, and there has been, of course, um, part of the backlash and the sort of uh, arguments of the illegitimacy of, of the CBAM are around the 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 shortfall of the EU and the UK to follow through on their on their climate finance, um, you know, offer, um, and um, and and do what they said they would do. Um, technology transfer is one of those great sort of black box <laughs> words that gets thrown around in a lot of uh, different policy documents, um, and clearly it is um, what needs to happen. Um, and I, you know, we have another CITP project that actually shows that um, multinational corporations, um, when who have internalized low carbon practices, when they open um, up shop in other countries, even if those countries don't have very strict um, decarbonization goals, they bring down emissions. So they bring those behaviors with them when when they go abroad rather than conforming to the higher emissions uh, standards of, of where they of where they open up. Um, I think there's a very detailed conversation that needs to happen there about what creates a favorable climate for investment um, and why and why not it why or why not it's it's happening. But certainly as a as a as a pathway it seems to be a, a good one. Tim, do you want to add to that? Yeah, just just quickly, I mean I I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean I don't think developing countries need technology as such the technology that you would use to decarbonize these industrial sectors is pretty well known the main problem is that it's expensive so i think what they need is uh, investment and then support to uh, both implement that investment and to kind of understand um, broader compliance issues and both of those are things that a green aid for trade policy should uh should consider and i do agree that i think if, if developed western economies like the eu are implementing uh things like cbams they do have a responsibility to consider their um oda programs to ldcs uh in order to help them comply i think it's reasonable to say that emerging markets should kind of help themselves out but it's hard to say it's hard to say well mozambique should just sort of suck it up you know a country like that does need it does need assistance and investment to comply yeah although to add having you know sort of worked in diffit or late lamented diffit i mean we were very nervous that in a sense the regular aid budget would become sunk completely into green matters and girls education or health services systems you know would 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 fall by the wayside now you know with cutting aid budget anyway but uh you know uh, I think, in a sense, um, you know, the development community would be pleased to see green finance as a separate and additional factor, rather than. Uh, so I'd, I'd find a different name. Um, I've got I've got a question now from uh, Craig uh, McMillan, um, and uh, perhaps you can deal with this, Tim. 
Uh, I mean, he says it's not the compliance of any C band be linked to the phasing out of the free allowances. So perhaps you can say just a little bit how the phasing in of the C band, the phasing out of free allowances will actually work. You know, and then you know, whether it does uh, sort of help or hinder uh, the legal case that, that, that perhaps would need to be made in the WTO. Well, it's absolutely directly linked to that. So in short, uh, yes, no, is the answer to your question, uh, Craig, that, you know, in order to um, ensure that, um, well, um, I, can't, I can't say whether it would ensure, in order to have the best possible chance, let me put it like that, of withstanding the inevitable challenges at the WTO, uh, the EU has a design CBAM, and this is partly why it's so complex, to be able to demonstrate that the costs pay, faced by an EU Im, an importer into the EU, uh, the carbon costs under CBAM are identical or almost the same as the costs faced by an EU producer of exactly the same product under the EU ETS. And that's the way they withstand, uh, you know, arguments that this is discriminatory or favouring EU domestic producers and so forth. So once you accept that broad legal concept, there's no way you can maintain free allowances for EU producers while charging a CBAM on imported products. That would effectively be regarded as a illegal subsidy to domestic producers because you would be compensating them for carbon leakage twice, both once through giving them free allowances and then once through the CBAM on imports. And so if you see the, the, the um, eight year period over which CBAM phases in is directly related to, it's on exactly, it is phased in on exactly the same trajectory as the free allowances are phased out. So no, there is not a way that um, allows both uh, free allowances and CBAM uh, to happen that would be WTO compatible. Okay, thanks. So I was about to close, but I see I've now got another question uh, from Manuel, uh, a real uh, belter. Uh, I wonder if the EU realistically expects the US to join a climate club. Um, Emily, do you want to start with this? Very briefly, we've only got a couple of minutes. Yeah, so um, and actually I was thinking when Tim was talking, well, the, the EU has done a pretty, uh, you know, careful job of trying to ensure that its measure is WTO compliant, though you can nitpick it, whereas there's no such assurances from, from, from the US if it were to attempt this policy. Um, I think that, you know, getting the US and EU to agree to do things the same way is one of the biggest pickles in uh in trade global trade geopolitics and has been for a long time um and and i would completely agree with tim that if there is going to be um a, a climate club it's go it's going to have to do with uh, first of all hashing out shared methods which sounds boring and technical but is actually incredibly difficult um and and both are both sides are very stubborn um, and it's also going to involve relaxation, I think, on both sides. So, um, you know, from the EU perspective, the way that the EU has done sort of conformity assessment is uh, very exacting in terms of exporting EU approaches. Um, and what this would demand is is stepping back from that and being able to find a middle ground uh, between a country, you know, with a country that doesn't price emissions in the same way at all. Um, so, so it's 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 where we need to go, but wh whether we can get there, I think, is is really the, the million dollar question. Perhaps I could just say, if anything, the dynamics the uh, the other way around is implied in your in your question. The U.S. wants to join the EU Climate Club because it wants exemption from CBAM for its steel exports, and the EU is saying we don't want you in it at the moment. And the main reason for disagreement is exactly as Emily was just saying, that at a federal level, the US doesn't have carbon pricing. And so it's very, very difficult to work out uh, in America what carbon price has actually been paid by a steel producer. So much easier in somewhere like Canada or the UK where there is carbon pricing, you know, you can refer to the market to work that out. The US uh, have a kind of complicated proposition for proxy values, but the EU basically says, well, look, WTO rules say it has to be the same and we can't work out what your carbon pricing is. So actually we can't do it. Thank you very much.
Okay, so that ends on a slightly more pessimistic note, I guess. Let me thank both Emily and Tim for a really fascinating and well-informed um, uh, discussion. Thank you to those of you in the audience who stayed and who posed questions. I think it's been a really interesting question. And I think we can predict with total certainty we're going to carry on talking about this over the next uh, few years. Um, okay, so let me say thank you very much. We tried to end strictly at two. We managed that. It's been a wonderful session. Thank you both.